Welcome, listeners, to the Information Nation, brought to you by the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, Division of Fish and Wildlife, Hunter Education Program. And as always, I'm your host, Scott Travers, the Hunter Education Coordinator for the state of Rhode Island. And I have with me Branton Elliman, who is helping me with all my editing and recording. We have with us today, as our special guest, Division of Fish and Wildlife's Pollinator Atlas Entomologist, Katie Burns. Welcome, Katie. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's great to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from originally? So I grew up on the coast of Maine. Um, Very lucky, lovely childhood um, near mudflats and forests. So I spent my childhood days looking for critters under rocks and things like that, which definitely added to (laughs) my future career. Um, I also watched a lot of those areas disappear over my childhood and late teens, and that was a big part of what led me to conservation and wanting to be an ecologist. Right, gotcha. So Maine must have been beautiful at that time growing up. Oh my gosh, yes. Everyone should go to Maine. (laughs) So you're totally familiar with our New England winters and all of our seasonal weather events. Being here in Rhode Island, it's actually pretty mild. It's nice. (laughs) Yeah, right. Fantastic. Cool. So how did you become the pollinator atlas entomologist? And and what is that? So the pollinator entomology um, position here um, at RIDEM was created so that we could comprehensively inventory uh, Rhode Island's insect pollinators, um, which is a really big task because that encompasses so many different groups of insects. So we've got bees, we've got flies, we've got butterflies, moths. Um, So in order to actually comprehensively inventory them, we can't all just go out and look for all of them at once. Um, We have to break it up into chunks. So right now we're focusing on bumblebees. Cool, cool. So can you tell us like how many pollinators there are? Or is it too broad a number to even mention? Oh my goodness. So lots and lots. Um, So like I said, those are some of the main groups of insects, but pollinators can also be mammals like monkeys or birds. So in terms of just bees alone, there are about 20,000 species of bee worldwide. Um, Here in North America, there's around 4,000, and that's just the bees. Um, So here in Rhode Island, it gets a little bit smaller. We have about 250 bee species that we suspect are here. Um, But since they haven't been comprehensively inventoried, there could be more. Wow, that's amazing. I had no idea there were so many. Yeah. (laughs) So now, is this the first time we're creating this atlas? Yeah, so there have been little patches of work done uh, by other organizations, particularly by URI um, with bumblebees, um, but there hasn't been a comprehensive survey. It's been a little bit piecemeal, so we're really excited to um, dig into it. Wow, no kidding, yeah. So how did you get into this? I, I, I You must have gotten some type of degree. Yeah, so I went to Wheaton College, so just kind of up the road in Massachusetts, <laughs> um, where I got my bachelor's in environmental science with a biology concentration. Then after that, I spent about three years working as a research assistant on various native bee and native pollinator projects um, before I went for my PhD at University College Dublin in Ireland. Um, so I've been there for the last four years. Wow, fantastic. So how was that? Oh my gosh, amazing. It was very serendipitous the way I ended up there. Everyone's like, oh, were you looking to be in Ireland. I'm like, no, that just ended up being the one that took me. (laughs) So um, really an amazing country, really beautiful landscapes, interesting pollinators and great people to work with. I worked with mainly farmers and they were just so generous with their knowledge. Oh, that's really amazing. Yeah. So now when we look at the the pollinators in Rhode Island, um, what can you tell me that separates them and makes them a little bit different perhaps than from what you saw in Ireland? Sure. So um, the diversity in species are different kind of wherever you go. So in Ireland, there are about 22 native bumblebee species here in Rhode Island. Historically, there are about 11. However, um, in the last few decades, we've only seen seven here. Recently, This wonderful bumblebee, the American bumblebee, Bombus pensylvanicus, was rediscovered here in Rhode Island. So this is one of those historic 11 species that I mentioned. Um, So that brought the previous six that we used to see here in Rhode Island up to seven. So we've only seen one specimen of it, you know, in the last 
decade or so, which again gives us lots of incentive to want to monitor the state and see if there are some of these other historic species um, hiding in undiscovered areas. Right. Wow. Cool. So the thing about um, pollen neuters, I would imagine, is that you don't necessarily go to all rural areas to look for them. You might find them quite often in urban areas. Absolutely. So this is why we're using a grid system for our Rhode Island bumblebee survey. So we've divided the state up into 165 grids, and each volunteer that joins our project is going to be responsible for one of those grids. And that way we can make sure we're really getting everywhere, even places that you might not think you would find a bumblebee. Um, yeah, because all of the other efforts before, really wonderful efforts from 2014 to 2021 um, carried out by Dr. Stephen Alm and Dr. Um, Howard Ginsberg at URI, they targeted flower-rich areas and found some really cool stuff. But we're now excited to look at some of these um, areas, again, that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find anything. Right, right. So this would actually be a great opportunity for people who want to get interested in, you know, citizen science and, you know, helping out with these kind of programs who might live in urban areas and who don't have access to rural areas to actually participate and and help out with this program. Absolutely. Your city parks, uh, cemeteries, those are all great places where you can look empty lots you know these uh pollinators are going to try and thrive wherever they can right. um so it's important that we're looking everywhere yeah yeah and again it's not like like some of these species where you're just not going to find them in an urban area at all you'll definitely find pollinators oh absolutely just look at any flowers grown out of the cracks and sidewalks you'll see something visiting Cool. Excellent. Yeah. So this is another reason that we really want to get an inventory of our bees here, because there might be pockets of the state that are just unexplored, where we might see some of those historic species that have gone undetected for several years. Gotcha. So uh, do you have any um, preliminary thoughts as to why that might be decreasing? Yeah. So there are lots of factors contributing to overall pollinator and insect decline worldwide. Um, there are, you know, the big hitters like climate change that we all know about. So that might be forcing um, certain species to change their ranges, to um, go to climates that are better suited to them. Um, probably the biggest contributor to uh, losses in pollinator diversity and abundance um, is land use change. So that's urbanization, that's an increase in agriculture, um, just changing the way that we use the land. And that can result in lots of different little factors. So increased pesticide use, loss of habitat, habitat, um, loss of connectivity, um, and general loss of forage resources, which, you know, bees and other bugs, they go together with flowers. They need yeah, those. <laughs> right, right, right. So it, it seems like pollinators have really been your thing from the beginnings on in your education. Yeah, so um, I always knew that I wanted to work outside. I wanted to work in a conservation capacity, um, which eventually led me to pollinators since, you know, I've always loved insects and they have a big conservation element um, to their whole being since they are in decline. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think um, of your prior experience probably helped you the most to get into your current career path? I'd say probably the best piece of advice I ever got was during my first native bee job. Um, I was working in Vermont and um, my supervisor, who was a PhD student at the time, he was like, if you're really serious about this, this is a really niche thing to be interested in. You need to go where the work is, which might mean sacrificing some personal things. And he was right. I mean, like I, but it also led me all over the world. Um, so it led me to Ireland. I got to live in so many different places in the United States. I worked in California, New Jersey, Vermont, uh, where Florida, in some really interesting and rural environments. And while it did mean that I wasn't with my family a whole bunch and probably some personal relationships weren't able to be sustained, um, in the end, it's what gave me the experience that I needed to then pursue a PhD, which then led me to this position. Right, gotcha. So you got a lot of great travel in and a lot of fantastic experiences. Yeah. And look, you wound up back in New England anyway. That's it. That's the dream. And yeah. a big, you know, I always like to put a big like asterisk on all of this that, you know, privilege obviously played a huge role in this and that I had a family home to return to in these in-between seasonal positions. So um, I think that this is just a big sign that we need to make this field more accessible to people because, you know, 
I was so lucky that I was able to do it because I had that safety net. But, you know, we need better pay for early career like biologists and more stability for them so that more people can, you know, reach this dream that I'm so happy to now be involved in. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And I think that really when we look at a lot of species study and conservation efforts, pollinators really aren't at the top of the priority list for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. People don't really think about insects very much. To most people, insects are kind of pests, especially, you know, things like flies and wasps, which are really important pollinators. Um, But people probably are more likely to call pest control when they see them rather than be like, yes, come to my garden. Right. Yeah. They think of it more of as a nuisance than as a necessary part of the entire system. That's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, what are your responsibilities uh, for the things you do, and and how do you go about doing your research? Sure. So um, here in this new position, the main focus has been to get our inventory up and running. So that's going to be our Rhode Island bumblebee survey, um, which is going to be piloted this spring. We're very excited to get going with a small group of volunteers, but will be open to the public in 2023 and 2024. But then other than that, a big part of my work here is to do outreach and talk to people about how they can improve their land and also, you know, on their businesses or in the general landscape for pollinator habitat. Right. So what are some of the things that people can do to improve that? the habitat yeah so i think the one that everyone has heard of most is you know planting native wildflowers the thing i always like to say is to embrace the mess so maybe mow your lawn a little less spend more time in your hammock um if you see you know dead branches or uh dead stems in your garden you know maybe leave them instead of thinking they're you know icky and not something that belongs there because they're really important habitat features Um, In the fall, leave the leaves so that our hibernating insect friends can have a nice blanket to keep them safe over the winter. Um, Don't use pesticides if you can avoid it. Obviously, sometimes they're needed, but um, being conservative with that um, can really help as well. Right, gotcha. And when people plant, uh, do you stress more natives or are you concerned about invasive plants coming in. Yeah, so invasive removal is actually a huge part of pollinator conservation because it can allow those native species to grow and thrive. Um, You can also, if you're going to your garden store, look for native species rather than cultivars. Cultivars are the little fancy name that comes after the species name. So if you see something with a scientific name and then something like crowned blue jewel it's probably a cultivar and maybe avoid that one right gotcha yeah so super important that people should be aware of yes absolutely so why is it important to study and to monitor the insect populations that we have today yeah so by inventorying and monitoring pollinators we're able to assess the status and distribution of our pollinator species and this can give us good information into the types of habitats that they're using and also which insects might need a little bit more help than others Um, in new england especially we're seeing um, disproportionate increases and decreases in certain species Um, so for example in the bumblebee world uh, the eastern bumblebee um, bombus impatiens is really rising in its population while others like like Bombus affinis, which is the rusty patch bumblebee, they're really going down. So it's important that we know about what each species is doing so we know how we can help them. Right. And is, is there a lot of competition between the species? Well, that's something that we're, you know, trying to figure more out about, um, especially when it comes to native species in terms of what types of habitats are supporting which and how that's influencing their inner dynamics. Um, A big thing that I think people don't think about as much is the relationship between managed honeybees, um, which is probably the pollinator that everyone (laughs) knows and loves most of all, and um, native bee species. So managed uh, honeybees are a non-native species in North America. They were brought over in the 17th century, but are now really culturally important people in North America and are used largely in our agricultural practices. Um, However, I always sort of want to steer people away from the whole, oh, to save the bees, I'll get a hive uh, message, which I think is really prevalent in the media right now, because it's almost equivalent to saying, oh, like, birds are dying, I'm going to get chickens. So honeybees are very much a a livestock species. And while you may have heard of colony collapse disorder, which is a very real thing, that's more of a 
an economic and beekeeper issue, um, kind of like if uh, a disease was affecting a, a livestock species. And while some of the things that might overlap in terms of factors that are contributing to bee decline, like lack of forage or pesticide use, those might affect both native bees and managed species. The native species don't have a beekeeper looking after them, so they really need more attention. And these managed pollinators, in addition, can sometimes compete with native species for forage resources. So again, if you're getting a beehive, make sure that there's plenty of forage around you so that they're not going to compete and be a responsible beekeeper. So monitor your hive for disease so that you don't uh, facilitate any spread of disease into native populations. Right. So it, it's important, like you're saying, that getting a hive isn't always the answer. Yes. I would say if, you know, your livelihood is to produce honey or if you're part of the agricultural industry, it makes sense to have um, honeybees or again, like they hold a lot of cultural importance, but just practice responsible beekeeping. And if you really want to help all bees, maybe don't get a hive and instead do some of those other things we talked about, like planting native wildflowers, keeping your garden a little messier. Right. Just support the native population. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about the Rhode Island Bumblebee Survey. Sure. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, um, it's going to be a two-year survey. Um, We are piloting it this spring, but it's going to be open to the public in 2023 and 2024. So this is a community science uh, effort where we're going to have community scientists, parts of the public, going out and surveying different areas of the state for bumblebees. So people are actually going to get a chance to catch and look up close at bumblebees, um, take pictures of them, and then submit them to us so that we can see what species are in what parts of the state. Oh, really cool. And you're going to work that through Jen Brooks? Yes. So right. she's my supervisor and the volunteer coordinator for RIDEM. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. So she would be the point of contact for people who are interested in assisting with this program then? That's it. So again, it won't be open to the general public until next year, but watch this space. We're definitely going to want as many people participating as possible next spring. Right. Gotcha. Through all... Uh, Throughout the whole state. The whole state. We want everything. All the islands, all the coastal areas, especially up north where quite a few, (laughs) we haven't done a lot of monitoring of a lot of species. (laughs) Gotcha. But that's okay because we're going to focus on it now, right? That's it. (laughs) Gotcha. Cool. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to actually have you back maybe in a year or so. Would love that. And we can talk about what progress you've made. Absolutely. Cool. So why should we care about bees and other insect pollinators? Oh, so bees and other insect pollinators are so important, not only for our food security, but also for supporting um, ecosystems. So about 90% of flowering plants require an animal pollinator in order to reproduce. The um, other 10 or so percent can reproduce through wind pollination and things like that. Um, but the others, they need a buddy to carry pollen from one flower to another so that that flower can produce uh, seeds and fruits. So these seeds and fruits provide food for other species like birds and mammals, which then provide food for larger carnivores. So it's a really important part of this system. And then, of course, it comes down to the food we eat. So about 70%... Uh, 76% of global crops um, are in some way benefiting from pollination. Um, So that's a lot of our our food. Um, And this includes some of our favorite foods like strawberries and apples, blueberries, coffee, chocolate. So we need these guys. Holy cow. Did you just say coffee? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I think you just perked a lot of people up by saying that. What? Bugs are important for coffee? (laughs) (laughs) So... Uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier. We talked about pollinators, and you said even some mammals are pollinators. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Sure. So in especially some tropical areas, um, things like monkeys can be pollinators because they also like to eat nectar. So they'll dip their faces inside of flowers and get covered with pollen. I always like to say that anything that comes up close and personal with a flower has the potential to be a pollinator. 
Gotcha. Yeah, I never thought of that. I always think pollinators, I think just of insects and nothing else. That's it. Insects are probably the most important and widespread pollinators. And bees out of the insects are the most important because they consume plant material, so pollen and nectar, at every stage of their life cycle. And they actively collect it. Um, while others are a little bit more accidental, where if they're furry enough, they'll get some pollen stuck in there. Right, right. So I know we talked a little bit about uh, causes of pollinator decline. Mm -hmm. What do you think probably is, you know, just like the, the top one or two? Yeah, so I'd say land use change is probably the biggest one. Right. Um, but I would say the one that is least talked about is disease spread, um, especially here in North America. And these different things contributing to decline can really vary depending on where you are in the world. So in North America, disease is becoming a little bit more of a prevalent factor. But I'd say overall, globally, land use change is the biggest one. Right, right. So um, of these diseases that um, affect um, these insects, what do you think, is, you know, can you describe the, the diseases to us? Sure. So some things can be caused by, you know, invasive parasites um, passed on by things like mites. Um, uh, there's like nosema, um, which is a type of gut parasite. So that can affect, I think, both honeybees and bumblebees. But again, these haven't been researched very extensively yet. And so we're still learning about the impacts of disease spread on our native species because it's pretty tricky to do these types of studies in the field on native species because, you know, they're not in boxes. We can't just go to them and look at them. Um, it's it's tricky um, and requires quite a lot of time, money, and effort. Um, but it's emerging and researchers are really working on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't think a lot of people think of that as well. You know, think about insects getting diseases. That's it. Yeah. I They have complicated little lives <laughs> and i think people don't really think about that when it comes to insects um you know i think a lot of people are surprised by the intricacies of like sociality with bees and things like that so we all know honeybees and how they have a queen and workers and that's their whole social system but people might be surprised to know that over 90 percent of bees are solitary um i call them the single working mothers of the bee world um where it's just one female who collects uh pollen and nectar for her one generation of babies with no workers involved um and these solitary bees are usually pretty small but can come in a variety of colors and patterns and shapes um I think people would maybe be surprised to see pictures of them and know that it was a bee. Yeah, yeah. So where can people go to find out more information about pollinators? Sure. So the Circe Society for Invertebrate Conservation is a great resource when it comes to learning about uh, pollinators and about ways that you can help them. Um, we also have the... Oh, the... Nature Conservancy of Rhode Island. They have some great plant lists and things like that. Um, so you can learn more about good plants that are good for pollinators. Gotcha. And you can probably access them on the web. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So we talked, oh, of course, before about how people can help pollinators. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how, again, a hive isn't always the best solution. Mm -hmm. Right. So are there any other ways that they can help? So uh, I get a lot of people asking me, especially those from urban areas, um, ways they can help if they don't have access to their landscaping, because a lot of the conservation recommendations that people give do have to do with your garden or your land. A huge thing you can do is just tell your friends and family about pollinators um, and let them know that they're important. Let them know that, you know, flies and bees and wasps and butterflies and moths are all really integral parts of our ecosystems and our food systems. Um, another thing you can do is if you don't have a garden per se, even just a window box is a great little stopover oasis for um, pollinators as they're flying through urban landscapes. Um, you can also participate in community science projects. So in 2023, we're going to want you for the Rhode Island Bumblebee Survey, but there's also things like Bumblebee Watch, which is through, I think, through the Searcy Society. Um, you can also participate in Beecology, which is another citizen science project. Um, so lots of ways you can help. Gotcha. And, and again, people's initial impression when they see a bee or a wasp shouldn't be to break out the pesticide. That's it, yeah. If, <laughs> if one's in your home, it's not out to get you. It's just confused. Get a cup and a piece of cardboard and take it outside. <laughs> right, yeah, we should all learn to live together, right? That's it, exactly. Gotcha. 
So one thing we always ask of, of all of our guests is for one funny or memorable story from the field. Oh, gosh. So do you have a funny story for us? Ooh, yep. I definitely have a story that revealed a part of me that I did not know existed. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to work in El Dorado National Forest in California, which is like very rural area. I was monitoring bumblebees out there. And for anyone who's familiar with that part of California, there are a lot of bears. Um, and we would see a few of them while we were driving, but I hadn't come up close with one for most of my season. Um, so one day I was in really dense brush and I was being really quiet because I was listening for bees. And then I heard this really loud crunching coming through the brush. And this big black bear sort of burst out at me. <laughs> and I'm a pretty cheerful, kind person, I'd like to say. <laughs> so I couldn't have anticipated reaching down and grabbing a stick and yelling, this is my forest. I am a predator. Get out of here. <laughs> Plus some expletives that I'm not going to say on this podcast. <laughs> we appreciate that. It's a, it's a family program here. Exactly. So I don't know. Maybe my fiance would disagree and say that that's <laughs> a very in character. But oh, gosh. Yeah. We both got very scared and he ran off and <laughs> so did I. <laughs> so you scared the bear off. I did. Yeah. Apparently... I've got a strength I didn't know existed. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, thanks. Wow. So now how can listeners get in touch with you if they have any questions, if they see a pollinator or if they see a hive and, and they're not sure what to do and they want to preserve or do anything other than just, you know, I, again, that horrible thing spraying pesticides everywhere or calling an exterminator? Absolutely. So the best way to get in touch with me is just through my email, which is katherine.burns.ctr at dm.ri.gov. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for being our guest for the podcast this month. And to all of our listeners, remember to please subscribe and share with your friends. And don't forget to tune in for our next episode. Where we'll be having a returning guest, Kim Sullivan the Aquatic Resource Education Coordinator, to talk to us about all the new and interesting things we'll be doing with the Aquatic Resource Education Program this season. We'll probably also have some top secret information on stocking sites for this season. So until next time, don't forget to take a moment to get outside and enjoy some of the wonderful natural resources we have in our wildlife management areas in the state of Rhode Island.